Okay, then uh, this afternoon, uh, looking at Kant's transcendental dialectic, uh, we're dealing really with his attitude to metaphysics. The two earlier sections of the Critique of Pure Reason introduce his epistemology. The transcendental aesthetic, of course, having to do with sense perception. The transcendental analytic having to do with judgments we make, the understandings we have, uh, because of the a priori categories, those concepts which interpret experience. Now, the, uh, the purpose of the whole critique is really to inquire whether rational metaphysics, rationalistic metaphysics, is possible. Is the project which Descartes began possible? Is the kind of metaphysics which, um, with similar ambitions, was proposed on an empirical basis by somebody like John Locke, is that really possible? The possibility of metaphysics. And already in the first two sections of the um, Critique of Pure Reason, dealing with epistemology, he's made it pretty plain that our knowledge extends only to phenomena, appearances, things as they seem to us, rather than to things in themselves, the noumena, reality, the unzip. So um, you have an anticipation already of a negative response to the question, is rational metaphysics possible? No. At least not rational metaphysics, where it's certainly demanded for knowledge. Now, what he does in the dialectic, however, is to examine dialectically the arguments that metaphysicians have put forward. It's one thing to say in advance of looking at it that it's not possible. It's another thing to look at the metaphysician's proofs and to show that they don't work. And that's exactly what he's doing. So that the transcendental dialectic is his attempt to analyze arguments concerning uh, the mind, the physical cosmos, and God. And to show that by virtue of their inevitable use of a priori concepts, that don't apply as far as we know to reality, the proofs themselves don't give us any knowledge of reality. So that's the overall direction that he's going. And you recall my comment earlier that um, in the introduction he observes that he's going to do away with knowledge in order to make room for belief. So he does that in the dialectic. And then he gets to talking about belief at the end. We don't have metaphysical knowledge, but we may have all sorts of metaphysical beliefs. And it's that knowledge-belief distinction, which is crucial for Kant, as it is, of course, for David Hume. Okay? So if your mind goes back to Plato's divided line, you see the Enlightenment has been pressing the whole area of human knowledge with certainty, and finding that not possible, retreating to the level of belief. But it still becomes important, as it was for Plato, to distinguish between beliefs that seem to be justifiable, and on the other hand, what is fiction, mere imagination, illusion. And uh, Hume has already made that distinction for himself. Uh, Kant obviously is going to have to. So, um, the dialectic, with its three parts. Now, um, in each case, what he's trying to do is to point up logical problems, and he labels the problem in the case of mind, arguments for the existence of mind, he labels the problem uh, paralogisms. Now, a paralogism is a step that goes beyond logic. Beyond logic. In other words, the arguments fail because the conclusion goes beyond what can be proven logically. Beyond what the premises require. Paralogisms. When we um, come to the cosmology section, he talks of antinomies. And an antinomy uh, occurs when the argument for a thesis and the argument against the thesis can both be given. You can prove both A and non-A. Ouch. What are you going to do there? Now, um, in that case, again, you have something which violates the laws of logic. It's against nomos, law. What's against laws of logic? Well, the law of logic is the law of excluded middle, A or non-A. And now you've got both A and non-A. So it's an antinomy is against the law of logic. Um, in the case of the arguments for the existence of God, um, he doesn't give a name to the kind of fallacy involved. He does say that what the arguments come up with is an ideal, an ideal of a human thought. Uh, he's free to say it's an ideal that the human mind seeks and wants and needs to round out and unify our understanding of things. But it's an ideal which in the end is not proven, though it may be postulated. To be postulated, to postulate something, is of course to propose it, to set it forth, to posit it, rather than prove it. So um, in all three cases, the same result occurs, namely that um, the theses are unproven. Okay. Now, um, let's um, start uh, with the rational psychology, the paralogisms there. And um, I think you can see rather quickly the way this goes. I think this is the easiest of the three sections. Um, what, uh, what he does is to point out that the whole science of rational psychology, as it's called, begins with Descartes' cogito, I think. And from a historical standpoint, really, that's correct, because the kind of metaphysics he's talking about is the kind that developed since Descartes, and in that German rationalist tradition particularly where it was customary to divide metaphysics into three sub-disciplines, given precisely these labels, physics of the day. And going back to Descartes, certainly rational psychology begins with his cogito. You remember Descartes' cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I exist. What am I? I'm a thinking thing, race cogitans. Uh, a thinking substance, a thinking thing. Now, that's the Cartesian-type argument, followed by others like Locke and Berkeley, the argument for a soul substance. The mind, the soul, is a thing, the thing that thinks. Now, his, his objection is to introducing the term race or substance. 
And if you, um, as, as I suspect you did not, memorize those 12 Kantian categories, uh, I, I told you you needn't, <laughs> but um, you can check back on them. And one of them is the category of substance, you see. So that if you, if you go back to, uh, to that material um, earlier in the uh, critique on page 389, 389, in the table of categories, you remember quantity, quality, relation, and modality, the categories of relation begin with the relation between substance and accident, substance and quality, substance and accident. Now, his point is that that connection between an accident and its underlying substratum, that relationship is an unknown relationship. We have a concept which we impose on things. So what's happening in this cogito ergo sum argument? It's fine as far as the sum is concerned, I am. But as soon as you introduce the race, you are adding to what is known directly. You're adding the notion of a substance. Now, cogito, all right, that's the, the property, the quality, the attribute. But if we don't know of any connections between a properties and, subst and their substances, then we cannot make a logical inference from the property I think. Therefore, to the uh, conclusion, I am a thinking substance. It is that the a priori conception of substance has intruded itself. And it has no objective reference that we have any knowledge of. Now, having, um, having said that, Kant, on the other hand, um, appreciates why it is that we are led to make that logical jump. Um, to say I'm a substance, a thinking thing, um, implies continuity of existence. So it, um, it, it's a vehicle whereby I affirm that the I who think now and the I who thought back then when I remember I'm thinking. And it's the I that will be thinking tomorrow when I think about having thought this today. So that the, uh, the intrusion of the concept of substance is not a bad thing. It uh, is simply that it affirms more than is uh, logically possible. It also guards against the danger of materialism. And for Kant, that is a danger. He doesn't like it. We'll see more of this subsequently. But uh, Kant is very much afraid that a realistic reading of Newtonian science with its blind causal mechanisms would produce some kind of a um, deterministic universe in which there is no such thing as freedom and no moral responsibility. As a result, um, he wants to guard against the dangers, as he calls them, of materialism. And uh, the uh, intrusion of the idea of soul substance, of course, is a denial of any reductionism of a materialist sort. But what happens is that introducing soul substance introduces a mind-body problem. What is the relationship between the mind substance and the body substance? Now, keep in mind, that's that awful pun again, uh, keep in mind that uh, neither mind nor body are, according to Kant, known as substance. So the mind-body problem, in the sense of the relationship between two substances, is a pseudo-problem. But it's a pseudo-problem created by the intrusion of the concept substance. And you'll find there's um, one place in which he observes there are three kinds of answer to that problem. There is the answer that there is some kind of causal connection. Physical causation is involved. That sounds like Descartes. But obviously that's going to introduce another a priori concept, the concept of causation. The alternative is to say that there is some pre-established harmony between the two. That's Leibniz. And the third alternative is to say that there is supernatural assistance. And that, of course, is the occasionalism, which says that it's God who produces the corresponding effects. But uh, that, again, would be um, speaking about something of which we do not know. So the fact that we um, hypostasize, to hypostasize is to treat it as a substance. Hypostasis, the Greek word for substratum, substance. It's the term used in the Trinitarian language of the early church. Three hypostases in one usia. Okay, came out as three persons in one essence. Um, but to hypostasize is to treat as a substance, something with enduring intellect. And to hypostasize mind and body, as uh, we do, is logically a paralogism. It goes beyond what logical acts. Now, um, that, in fact, is only one of the paralogisms involved in rational psychology. And it's the one which we're given in the anthology. Uh, but there are three others as well. And if you look at page 418, uh, you can uh, see very quickly what the others are. And if you want, you can get a complete copy of the Critique of Pure Reason from the library and read what he says about all the others but um, they follow very naturally from the first. It's not just that the soul is substance, that's within the categories of relation. But number two, as regards quality, the categories of quality, it is simple. That is to say, it is what it is, indivisibly. Indivisibly. And if you go back to the categories as listed on 389, the categories of quality, of relation, negation, limitation, okay, from the logical qualities, affirmative propositions, negative propositions, indefinite propositions. So this, um, to say that it is simply what it is, is to ascribe reality, you see? So that is another a priori concept introduced. Number three, he says, um, has to do with different times in which it exists, numerically identical in its unity. And this seems to be a category of quantity. Quantity, it has its own singular identity through time. That's another a priori concept. And then um, number four, in relation to possible objects of space, that's implied in the mind-body problem. In relation to possible objects of space, possibility and necessity, that's yet another category. So he runs through the four kinds of categories, quantity, quality, relation, modality and shows how in rational psychology all four of those kinds of categories are involved. 
And so what you really have in that branch of metaphysics is really uh, an imaginative construct made up out of those a priori concepts imposed on our actual experience, reflective introspection. Now, does that come through clearly? Comments? Questions? You're staring. You mean it's that easy? Yeah, um, that in effect is it. You see? His point is that these a priori categories are categories of understanding, they're not categories of reality. Because they're not categories of reality, they um, crunch the empirical input into unreal ways of thinking. And as a result, the, not only the cogito ergo sum, what am I, race cogitans, not only is that going beyond logic, uh, but so is the claim that I as a thinking thing stand in relationship to extended things. Obviously. That doesn't apply either. I as a thinking thing extend back through time and so forth. That doesn't apply either. I as a thinking thing can possibly extend on into the future. That doesn't apply either. I can run these cables before I trip over them. That would be another paralogism. Uh, okay, um, anything then on the rational psychology? Sounds straightforward? I said, um, Kant should have said it much more briefly. Okay, um, keep in mind that he's not denying the existence of soul substance. He's not denying the existence of soul substance. He's saying you don't have a valid argument. Maybe all sorts of bad arguments for good causes. He's not denying it. He's not affirming it either. When it comes to talking about God, we'll see that he affirms the existence of God, even though he says you don't have a good argument. And in regards to soul, he seems to say you, have a, you don't have a good argument, but he's not prepared to affirm it. This juncture, at least. Okay, um, rational cosmology uh, involving these conflicting truths. And here, if you would, turn to, uh, let's see, page 428, 429 in, uh, in there, 428, 429. Um, his point here is that the terms soul and world should both be regarded not as representations of reality, but as what he calls regulative concepts, in the sense that they regulate what we then say. The soul is regulative in that it keeps us from um, materialism. The uh, world also is a regulative concept. Um, it regulates the way in which we synthesize our thinking about physical things, we, the way in which we project our experience. Now, on 429, you see him doing much the same thing in this case as he did with psychology. Here you have, again, the identification of four areas of cosmology, as he puts it just above the breakdown, according to the four titles of the categories, quantity, quality, relation, and modality. So you notice that the first one, dealing with absolute completeness of composition of the whole, the second dealing with the vision, infinitely or finitely divisible. The first is whether um, the cosmos is finitely or infinitely extended in time and space. So the first has to do with that infinite extension, space and time. The second with finite or infinite divisibility, chop up ability. The third having to do with relationship, um, the origination. And the fourth having to do with modality, the complete dependence, contingency or necessity. And so each of the areas of categories is again involved. Then he gets to taking up each of these in its turn. And on page 433, uh, you can see the structure of his thinking. The thesis is that the world has a beginning in time and is limited also with regards to space. It's finite in duration temporally and in extension spatially. The antithesis is the opposite. The world is no beginning, no limits, but is infinite in regards to both time and space. And he is going to show... Now, his procedure is what in logic we call a reductio ad absurdum. Where you may recall, you should, I hope, recall uh, from your logic course, if you haven't taken a logic course, you are impoverished. Um, a 